An American Plague by Jim Murphy Chapter 11 A Modern Day Time Bomb For all of history and all over the globe, she has been a nuisance, a pain, and an angel of death. Andrew Spielman and Michael D'Antonio, 2001 September 1, 1858 Emotions were running high at the Marine Quarantine Hospital in Staten Island. Major yellow fever epidemics had struck Manhattan and the surrounding towns in 1702, 1731, 1742, and 1743, and then every year from 1791 through 1821. Now, after a gap of 37 years, the fever was back again, infecting and killing more and more people every day. New York's medical community knew little more about this invisible killer in 1858 than Philadelphia's had in 1793. The one difference was that early in the 19th century, Manhattan had established very strict quarantine rules. Anyone suspected of having the disease was shipped off immediately to the quarantine hospital. There they could recover or die well away from the healthy population. While no one knew the exact origin of yellow fever, most ordinary citizens as well as many medical professionals insisted it was an imported disease. Very few people wanted to believe that such a terrible killer could originate in their hometown. This belief that the disease was brought in resurfaced wherever the fever struck. In 1793, for instance, most Philadelphians blamed the refugees from Santo Domingo. In Manhattan, the Irish were blamed, and the quarantine effort was aimed primarily at weeding out sick Irish immigrants from arriving ships. The Quarantine Hospital was the country's leading facility for the treatment of yellow fever and highly praised for its cleanliness and safety. But this didn't matter to its neighbors. People living near the hospital blamed it and its Irish patients for breeding pestilence and spreading it throughout the island. As darkness fell on September 1, 1858, angry citizens took matters into their own hands. About 9 o'clock on Wednesday, Harper's Weekly reported a large party, disguised and armed, assailed the hospital on two sides at the same time. One squad forced the gate, and the other scaled the wall. Alarms were sounded, but before any effective resistance could be offered, the rioters had removed the patients out of the buildings, carrying them bodily up their mattresses, and depositing them upon the ground some hundred yards from the wards. Once this was accomplished, the building was set on fire and burned like a pile of shavings. Next, the resident doctor's house was set afire, followed by a small hospital on a nearby hill. The harbor police and firefighters arrived and managed to put out the latter two fires before the buildings were completely destroyed. The very next day, the determined crowd came back and finished burning down the remaining structures. While Harper's Weekly described the efforts of the firefighters and police as a stirring scene, the magazine's editors were clearly opposed to the presence of the hospital, calling it a grave injury to both Staten Island and Manhattan. Some arrests were made, but no one was ever prosecuted for rioting or arson. The specter of yellow fever had incited a normally peaceful group of individuals to violence, and Staten Island officials did not want that mob to turn its fury on them. Yellow fever terrorized many major cities throughout the 1800s, not only Philadelphia and Manhattan, but Boston, Baltimore, Mobile, Norfolk, and Portsmouth, Virginia, Savannah, Charleston, and Jacksonville, to name a few. 9,000 died in New Orleans in 1853, while Memphis saw 2,000 buried in its 1873 epidemic and another 5,000 in 1878. As late as 1897, letters from the South often arrived with the words, all male fumigated with formaldehyde written on them. Countries outside the United States suffered deadly yellow fever attacks as well. When Toussaint La Overture led a revolt of black Haitian slaves in 1801, Napoleon sent his brother-in-law, General Charles Leclerc, and a military force of approximately 29,000 to crush the rebels. The French killed nearly 150,000 Haitians in their attempt to take back control of the island. Then yellow fever hit the French troops. After 26,000 soldiers and sailors, including Leclerc, had died, the French packed their tents and left. Haiti was lost to the French, and Napoleon's ambitions for an empire in the New World withered away. Two years later, in 1803, France sold 
its North American territory to the United States and the Louisiana Purchase. Epidemics of yellow fever also struck numerous cities in South America, Europe, Russia, and West Africa. Wherever the climate was warm and large groups of people assembled, whether living in established cities or in tents during military campaigns, yellow fever took its toll. Although millions of fever cases were studied and thousands of autopsies performed, not much new was learned about the disease during the entire 19th century. In 1878, the best medical advice a Memphis newspaper could offer frightened readers was keep cool, avoid patent medicines and bad whiskey, go about your business as usual, be cheerful and laugh as much as possible. Doctors were thoroughly baffled by yellow fever. But curiosity and fear drove a number of them to continue to investigate and speculate on its cause, spread, and treatment. In 1848, Dr. Josiah Knott in Alabama noticed that yellow fever receded after swamps were drained off to kill mosquito infestations. Was the mosquito not wondered the cause of the fever? It was very possible that Knott, in reading about yellow fever epidemics from the past, had come across Rush's mention of those little red spots on patients called Pedicha that resembled mosquito bites. The idea that such a tiny creature could kill a human was considered preposterous in Knott's day. Besides, Knott did not perform any experiments to prove his theory. It remained an educated guess based on logic and circumstantial evidence and was largely ignored by medical professionals. One doctor familiar with Knott's theory was intrigued enough to follow up on it. In 1880, Dr. Carlos Finlay of Havana, Cuba, captured mosquitoes and let them ingest the blood of patients suffering from yellow fever. Then, in an experiment that would be considered highly unethical today, he allowed these mosquitoes to feed on healthy humans. To his ama amazement, 20% of the healthy patients soon developed mild cases of the disease. The following year, Finlay presented his conclusions in a paper called The, Mo the Mosquito, hypothetically considered as the agent of yellow fever. His idea certainly received a great deal of attention, almost all of it negative. Because his subjects had not gotten full-blown yellow fever, many scientists thought that Finlay had failed to prove the relationship between mosquitoes and the disease. Some even suggested that he might have seen yellow fever when it wasn't really present in order to support his theory. It would be more than 20 years before another doctor took Finlay and his work seriously. During those two decades, remarkable discoveries were made that changed the entire science of medicine. The 1880s saw two scientists, Francis Louis Pasteur and Germany's Robert Koch, isolate various bacteria, extremely small one-celled creatures, living in animals and humans, and link them to specific diseases. Then, in the late 1890s, two Germans, Frederick Loeffler and Paul Frosch discovered other disease-causing organisms, even tinier than bacteria, called viruses. None of these discoveries related specifically to yellow fever. They did, however, put an end to the notion of humors as a medical theory. And they established the possibility that many of other diseases might be caused by creatures too small to be seen by the human eye. It was in 1900 that a young doctor, Jesse Lazier, entered the picture as a member of the U.S. Army Fever Commission. The commission had been set up in Cuba following the Spanish-American War to discover the cause of yellow fever and develop a cure. Fewer than 400 American soldiers had been killed in the actual fighting on the island, while over 2,000 died of yellow fever. The United States government wanted this deadly enemy identified and eradicated. Lazier had read Finley's paper and thought his experiments while clearly inconclusive, showed promise and should be carried out more fully. In addition, he was aware that in 1898, two scientists working separately had announced that a mosquito was able to carry the human malaria parasite and transmit it to humans. A mosquito, Lazier reasoned, might also be the carrier of yellow fever. None of this impressed Walter Reed, the army doctor who headed the commission. Reed favored the idea that a bacterium, first identified by Ita Italian scientists and usually found in swamps, was the culprit. But to his credit, Reed let Lazier proceed with his experiments on a limited basis. Lazier's early attempts to show that mosquitoes could transmit the disease from a sick person to a healthy one failed in all but one case. Tests to duplicate this success also failed until a colleague on his, of his on the commission, James Carroll, caught the disease from an infected mosquito and nearly died. 
These two positive results suggested to Lazier that he was very close to proving Finley's theory. But even this success in sight, Lazier was extremely nervous about potential criticism. Both Knott and Finley had been dismissed by their medical colleagues, and he did not want to suffer the same sad fate. In a letter to his wife, Lazier cautioned her that nothing must be said as of yet, not even a hint. I have not mentioned it to a soul. On September 13, 1900, Lazier was in a, a Havana hospital's yellow fever ward letting mosquitoes feed on patients. As Lazier did his work that day, a mosquito that was not part of his experiment landed on his hand. He thought to shake the insect off, but did not want to interrupt the procedure he was performing. So he watched as the mosquito patiently probed his hand with the cutting part of the proboscis, then sucked his blood for over a minute before flying off. Two days later, Lazier felt ill. Two days after that, he was confined to bed as yellow fever racked his body. For 11 days, he suffered a high fever, agonizing sweats, and abdominal pain. Black vomit and delirium followed. Finally, on September 25, the 35-year-old doctor died. James Carroll and another colleague, Aristides Agramonti, felt that Lazier had established a connection between mosquitoes and yellow fever and sent a detailed report of his work to Walter Reed, who was in Washington, D.C. at the time. Reed's initial reaction was anything but encouraging. I cannot say that any, any of your cases prove anything, he wrote back to Carroll. Even so, Reed was able to once again push aside his doubts and his own strongly held opinions about how humans contracted the disease. Besides, a dedicated colleague had died for his theory. The least Reed and his team could do was conduct careful tests that would either prove or disprove this idea conclusively. On his return to Cuba, Reed initiated a series of experiments involving volunteers and insect-tight tents. Healthy subjects spent the night in one tent with a swarm of infected mosquitoes hungry for a meal. In a separate tent, other healthy subjects slept wrapped in blankets soiled by the black vomit of patients. Those exposed to the mosquitoes eventually sickened, though happily none died. Those who slept on the soiled blankets remained healthy. Less than one month after Lazier's death, Walter Reed was able to announce that mosquitoes transmitted the disease and even named the culprit, the female Aedes agpiti mosquito. The male of the species prefers plant nectar to blood. Despite the evidence provided by Reed's commission, many people were still not convinced that the bite of a tiny mosquito could cause a fatal illness. The Washington Post announced the findings in a November 2, 1900 editorial. Of all the silly and nonsensical, nonsensical rigmarole of yellow fever that has yet found its way into print, there has been enough of it to build a fleet. The silliest beyond compare is to be found in the arguments and theories generated by a mosquito hypothesis. Fortunately, scientists in other parts of the world were able to verify the commission's experiments and prove the theory. Of course, establishing the Aedes aegypti mosquito as a disease carrier or vector did not answer all the questions about yellow fever. The actual source of the yellow fever virus, tree-dwelling monkeys in African and American rainforest, was not identified until 1929, and a safe and effective vaccine was not developed until 1937. But knowing that a mosquito could spread the disease proved vital in Cuba. Patients with yellow fever were isolated in rooms with screens on the window so that mosquitoes couldn't feed on their infected blood and then transmit the disease to healthy individuals. Next, the breeding areas of Aedes agapiti was systematically destroyed. The mosquito is almost entirely dependent on humans for its breeding areas. The still water found in water barrels, cisterns, canals, ponds, sewers, gutters, and outhouses, even a tin can with an inch of water in it, can be the birthplace of hundreds of hungry and potentially dangerous mosquitoes. It was this dependence that made Aedes agapiti the perfect creature to carry yellow fever in Philadelphia in 1793. Its eggs were unwittingly brought aboard ships and water casks, where they hatched into larvae and grew into adult mosquitoes in seven days. These insects were a nuisance, but not dangerous, until they bit a person who'd come abroad from the virus. During the next 12 days, the yellow fever traveled through this mosquito's body until it reached her salivary glands. After that, every time she fed on someone, she discharged some of the virus into her prey. 
At the time, a transatlantic sailing voyage might take anywhere from one to two months. This meant that passengers and crew were trapped on board with successive generations of diseased insects. When the ship finally docked, the infected mosquitoes flew off to establish new homes and create new fever victims near the open sinks, wells, water barrels, and privies that were everywhere in the city back then. In Cuba in 1900, the Yellow Fever Commission sent out soldiers to patrol the city of Havana, going street by street, house by house, searching for open water containers that might be breeding spots for Aedes agapiti. Anything that could act as a breeding site was either emptied of water or smashed. Larger bodies of water, such as ponds, were treated with larva-killing oil. A great many citizens felt such measures, measures were harsh and unfair especially after being fined when mosquito eggs were found on their property. But the campaign proved successful. Within six months, yellow fever was all but gone from Havana. If people in 1793's Philadelphia had only listened when A.B. had explained how to kill off mosquitoes breeding in water barrels, the fever there might have ended weeks sooner and hundreds if not thousands of lives might have been saved. The same thorough mosquito-controlled measures were instituted in Isthmus of Panama, where work to dig a canal to connect the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans had bogged down. The French had initiated the canal project in 1881, but almost immediately encountered yellow fever and malaria, which is transmitted by a number of species of Anopheles mosquitoes. At one point, 7,000 of their 19,000 workers were ill with the disease. By the time the French company halted construction in 1889, more than 30,000 workers and engineers had died. The United States took over the project in 1904 and encountered the same disease enemies as the French. The difference was that now the United States knew what to do. An aggressive anti-breeding area campaign was launched and once again proved to be highly successful. Yellow fever was almost completely eliminated in Panama. Because Anopheles mosquitoes have slightly different breeding areas from Aedes agapiti, there were still hundreds of cases of malaria, but overall the campaign worked. Only 2% of the workers in the U.S.-led project were hospitalized at any one time, compared with 30% for the French. The Havana and Panama campaigns controlled yellow fever and the Aedes agapiti mosquito in those regions, but they did not eliminate the disease completely. It continued to terrorize numerous cities, especially in Central and South America. Finally, in 1947, the Pan American Sanitary Bureau, later renamed the Pan American Health Organization, decided to eradicate the mosquito and thus the disease in the entire Western Hemisphere. Along with destroying breeding areas, adult mosquito populations were also attacked with the widespread use of pesticide dichlorodefinyl trichloroethane, better known as DDT. Much of it sprayed from planes. By 1962, 21 countries declared themselves free of Aedes agapiti, and the world seemed very close to ending yellow fever forever. That was when problems began to develop in the United States. First, experts in mosquito control complained that Congress had not budgeted enough money for the campaign to succeed. Virtually every southern state was infested with Aedes agapiti, these experts pointed out, but funds would run out before the job of eradicating the mosquitoes was half completed. Second, concern about the health risk and environmental problems associated with the use of DDT increased during the 1960s. These fears were given a public platform with the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962. In this groundbreaking book, the author tackled many emerging ecological concerns, such as the environmental dangers associated with radiation, but it was the use of DDT and its potential health risk to both animals and humans that grabbed the public's attention. The book became a bestseller and convinced many citizens and politicians of the dangers posed by indiscriminate spraying of DDT and other chemicals. The use of DDT would be banned in the United States in 1972, but the anti-mosquito campaign had died long before that. Actually, Carson had predicted that the, that the campaign would fail even if the spraying continued as mosquito control experts wanted. it. Spraying kills off the weaklings, she explained. The only survivors are insects that have some inherent quality that allows them to escape harm. These are the parents of the new generation, which by simple inheritance possess all the qualities of toughness inherent in its forebears. In other words, super mosquitoes were being created that were capable of resisting DDT. 
Careful testing established that it takes about seven years for this new mosquito to emerge and replace the old one. In addition, some evolutionary process happens when newer pesticides such as malathion 7 and permethrin are used. As this new pesticide resistant Aedes agapiti gradually reestablished itself in Central and South America, another problem was noted. Because the old mosquito, and with it the disease, had been absent so long, hardly anyone had built up immunity to yellow fever. As a result, hundreds of millions of people were susceptible to getting yellow fever and other deadly diseases carried by Aedes agapiti. An even more alarming problem was that several mosquito-borne diseases had begun to change. Malaria was the first in which a change was observed. Prior to the 1960s, a number of drugs, such as atabrine and chloroquine, had been developed that effectively treated the illness. Unfortunately, patients would often use only enough of these medicines to reduce the symptoms, saving the rest for future bouts of the disease. Many of the microscopic parasites that produce malaria would survive the sublethal dose and produce offspring capable of withstanding a full dose of the medicine. This drug-resistant type of malaria began to appear among U.S. troops during the Vietnam War in which more soldiers were incapacitated by the disease and by battle wounds. Despite the introduction of different, more powerful drugs, the new kind of malaria spread across Asia, then to Africa, and eventually to South America. Today, 10% of the world's population suffers from malaria every year, resulting in almost 3 million deaths. In the time it takes to read this sentence, another person has died of malaria. It's clear now that mosquitoes, animals, and human disease go together. We know that the virus that causes West Nile encephalitis is carried by birds that travel up and down the east coast of the United States, and that mosquitoes feed on them and then give the disease to humans. Aedes albicidus, better known as the Asian tiger mosquito, sucks the blood of both animals and humans and is capable of carrying a wide variety of viruses, including dengue fever, eastern equine encephalitis, West Nile encephalitis, and lacrosse encephalitis, all serious illnesses and all potentially lethal to humans. In fact, of the 2,500 kinds of mosquitoes that infest the world, almost 400 of them are capable of transmitting diseases to humans. No animal on earth, a cert mosquito expert, Andrew Spielman and Michael D'Antonio, has touched so directly and profoundly the lives of so many human beings. With their glassy wings, delicate legs, and seemingly fragile bodies, mosquitoes are nevertheless a powerful, even fatal presence in our lives. Which brings us back to Aedes agapiti and yellow fever. The disease exists anywhere there are monkey populations, as does the pesticide-resistant mosquito that can transport the disease to humans. As new roads are cut into virgin rainforest, more and more people enter areas where they can become infected. A car ride takes that newly infected person to a major city, where more Aedes agapiti mosquitoes wait to feed on him, then carry the disease to another and another and another person. A plane ride carries one of these infected persons to a new country, where still more Aedes agapiti wait to feed and fly off. Two factors make the situation especially dire in the United States. First, no company here has produced the vaccine in recent years. If the disease invaded a large city, and a call went out for hundreds of thousands of doses of the vaccine, it would take months to produce it. The U.S. Institute of Medicine studied the situation in 1992 and estimated that an outbreak of yellow fever in a city like New Orleans would infect 100,000 people and kill at least 10,000 of them before it could be brought under control. Second, despite years of research, there is still no cure for yellow fever. While modern medicines can lessen the impact, the disease has on the human body once a person has yellow fever, he or she will have to endure most of the horrible symptoms that Philadelphia's people suffered in 1793. Once urban transmission begins in the American region, Dwayne Gubler, a director at the Center for Disease Control warns, it's probably going to spread very rapidly throughout the region to other urban areas and then from there to Asia and the Pacific. In other words, Yellow fever is a modern-day time bomb. We're just sitting here waiting for it to happen. The situation is the kind that produces nightmares in thoughtful people. 
yet the history of yellow fever offers hope. We know, for instance, that Benjamin Rush was alert enough to recognize the disease before it had spread much beyond Water Street and sound it an alert. Modern doctors should be able to spot yellow fever and issue warnings even sooner. We know, too, that the anti-mosquito breeding campaigns in Cuba and Panama were very effective in halting the infection, and that massive insecticide campaigns can control the population of Aedes aegypti. Prompt warning and fast, if unpleasant, action have kept yellow fever and related diseases in check over recent decades as well. And the same will be true in the future. Meanwhile, dedicate, dedicated scientists develop theories and test them, hoping to discover a safe and effective cure. Yet, if the history of yellow fever tells us anything, it is that this is a struggle with no real end. Yellow fever, as we know it now, might be conquered. But another version of the disease will eventually emerge to challenge us again. And when it does, we will have to overcome our fears and be prepared to confront it.